Welcome to video three in the Python for Corpus Linguists workshop. And in this video, we are first going to have a look at a few new concepts and a few new tools. And then we are going to work through exercises eight to 17. And just so you know, this is a recording made at the end of 2022, beginning of 2023. And this replaces, so to speak, the live session that I've done in 2020 and 2020. One, in this session, we are going to work through the exercises in a more or less empty notebook. And this might become a bit messy, but after um, this session, you can have a look at the provided solutions notebook that is a bit more structured than what we're going to work on during this video. Also, please note there are additional notebooks and exercises. Just have a look at lear your learning path for more materials. In this session or in this module, we will look at a number of things, primarily concordances, n-grams, frequency analysis, basic statistics, basic collocation analysis. We will be using NLTK for stemming lemmatization. We also will use WordNet. We're going to look at SPACI, namely for tagging. We will be parsing some XML. We will do some web scraping. And ultimately, we're going to bring all of this together to do some keyword analysis. In some cases, we are going to use, or we're going to try to find two solutions in which we will use well-established libraries and tools, for example, the Natural Language Toolkit or SPACI. And we're also then going to implement some of these solutions in plain, well, more or less Python, so that we can understand how these things might work under the hood, but also so that you can see how this would be solved in a more real life or in a research environment using established tools. So some of the new things we are going to use, and I want to front load you a little bit with a few hints. We're going to look at importing using other libraries. We're going to look at classes and methods. We're going to look at list comprehensions. We're going to look at pandas, a library that is primarily used in data science. And more particularly, we're going to look at data frames. You can think of these as sort of tables to use. We're going to look at the enumerate feature. We're going to look at text directory. Well, we've looked at text directory, but it's going to be a refresher. And I'm going to introduce you to a very handy little Unicode tool called FTFY. And we're going through these uh, one by one, so don't worry. A note, as this has been recorded in 2022, late 2022, in 2022, a number of very interesting tools have emerged. And I want to at least um, mention them here so that you have an idea of what's out there. And Primarily, I'm talking about so-called large language models. And without going into details, these are models that are then put into tools, for example, JetGPT, that have the capacity, beyond many other things, it's uh, very interesting to look at them, to produce working code based on prompts. These are sort of instructions. So you have these language models that have sort of knowledge about how programming works or how how, for example, Python works, and you can give them an instruction and they will give you back more or less working code. And most recently, in December 2022, OpenAI's JetGPT has demonstrated fairly advanced capabilities in both, well, writing uh, texts, but also in coding. Um, here to the right, you can see an example. So the prompt here, so to speak, the instruction was write a Python script that tokenizes an English text. And then the system, the AI system, returns, sure, here's a simple script that tokenizes an English text using the NLTK library. So the system here decided to, to use that library. Um, well, decided is a bit far-fetched. It uh, picked up on the fact that this might work and it provides some code here and it will also provide us with a possible output here. And without going into any details, this code actually works. It's actually a reasonable way of doing this. And we can just use this small example here to see how these AI tools or AI tools like, like JetGPT, like GPT-3, are actually able to produce code and assist us in coding. This is not part of this uh, workshop, but it is important to realize and to know that these tools are now out there and that these tools can actually help you in not just writing code, but understanding code and maybe optimizing what you've been doing. And I can only advise you, so to speak, to do some research and to look into this. All of that being said, please keep in mind that these tools or these language models, while extremely powerful and helpful, are quite unreliable. They will give you meaningful, or at least what, what seems to be meaningful output, but it's not necessarily the case that this is true or that this actually works. 
Also, there are significant legal and ethical questions that are still unanswered. Most importantly, these models have been trained on more or less the internet, and it is still very much debated what this means from a perspective of authorship and um, how we treat the fact that these models have learned, so to speak, from others and how much of their work is in the output um, that these models produce. So just keep that in mind, but look into it. It's not just fun, but can also be extremely helpful. We will now go through these preliminaries and look at a few new concepts that you need to understand for these exercises. So first of all, we're going to look at importing. And importing, and you've seen this already, essentially means that we are using other libraries that we are using, external Python modules, for example, in our code. And there are a couple of ways of doing this. Here are the three most common ones. So on the top, import NLTK, we're importing the whole library. So we want all of NLTK available to us. And then in our code, we can use NLTK dot, this dot notation is very important, for example, stem, and then within stem, there is the porter stemmer. Now we can also, if we know that we just need that porter stemmer, we can just import that specific thing. And to do this, we do from NLTK dot stem import porter stemmer. And this will make available to us porter stemmer, not the whole library, but just that. And now something you'll see, not just in my code, but if you look at other people's code, is that sometimes we use shorthands, for example, for libraries that we use extremely often. So for example, pandas, which is used in data science a whole lot, often is imported as import pandas as pd. And this allows us to then just do pd.dataframe. So you can sort of introduce these shorthands. And some of these are fairly standardized. So most people within the data science community will use PD for pandas. So now for the first time here, we are in the notebook that we're going to use. And don't worry, there's already a lot of stuff in here, but we will go through this. So first of all, this is the notebook. We are going to look at the environment. And talking about importing, you can see that I've already written a lot of code here. And I'm just going to run you through this environment pretty quickly, and then we're briefly going to talk about what we just looked at in the slides namely the import statements. So first of all, we are going to use these two commands to basically clone or download the repository. We're then going to install some dependencies, text directory, just text and FTFY. And while this runs, we're going to look at these import statements. So here I've already put in all the imports for all of the exercises. So we could go through this one by one, I'm not going to do this, but I've already put this in here to save some time. But you can see the different variants here. So on top here, we can see some imports from Python standard library. So these are things you don't need to install, but they come ship with Python, so to speak. Within the Python world, they basically talk about um, Python has batteries included. So this is all the things that you might need. So here we have regular expressions, we have statistics, and we have the math. And then you can see that we import some more specific things. For example, here from collections, import counter, or from IO import string IO, and you don't necessarily need to understand at this point what these are, but just think about these import statements. So for example, um, here we do what we just talked about, import pandas as PD. So this will make available the pandas library to us as the shorthand PD. Or down here with the um, NLTK, for example, the porter stemmer example. So from NLTK.stem, so within the NLTK library, there is a module called stem. And from this module, we just want one thing and that's the porter stemmer. Well, we actually also want the Lancaster stemmer and we want the WordNet lemmatizer, but you get the idea. We want to have these three things available to us. We're going to import this. All right, so we can now also run this code cell here so that we have all of these available to us down the line. And then finally, we're also going to download to Corpora the HUM19 UK, as well as the COCA sampler, and we're going to use these in the exercises down below. I've provided scripts here to download these corpora, and you don't necessarily have to think about these too much. If you're really interested, have a look at these scripts, but essentially what they do is they download these corpora and make them available to us here in our environment. And you can see this in a second here. Um, if I open up this files view, then in here we have, first of all, what we've downloaded from the repository. And within that, you can then see that in data, we now have these two corpora available to us. Um, for example, here, the um, 
academic texts uh, or the blog post and so on and so forth. And then finally, we have a helper function here <coughs> that we will use later to look at large dictionaries. Uh, you don't need to think about this for too long. All right, let's go into some of the new tools and hints here. And we will start by looking at classes and objects. So classes are blueprints for so-called objects. So here we have an example, and we're going to run through this example. So in the first line, on the left, so this is our class definition, we create a class called word. So we want a blueprint for something, for an object, and then later is a word. And every class definition starts usually, there are some other options of doing this, with a so-called init definition. And this is where this class starts. So if we create a new object, and you can see how we do this on the right here. So we could create, once we have this class, we can create a new word by saying a word, and then for example, cat. And that's the object um, or the instantiation of that object. And once we do this, this first method here, init, will run, so to speak. Here, we do the following. We assign self.word to the word that's provided, so cat here. And then we calculate the length of those, that word using len. Now, the magic word here is self, and self refers, put very simply, to this object itself. So within this self, we store variables, we store values that refer to this object, so that in other methods within this class, we can use them as well. Here's an example. So once we now have this new object, this new cat, uh, cat word, we can now call methods or functions within that class. So here in the class to the left, we have to find reverse. And now we can call this on our new object. And this will reverse the word. And we could then also create multiple words. So now that we have this blueprint, we can create as many objects as we want. So for example, here we can create a word dog, and then we can use this the same way. Um, this will make a lot more sense once we look at this in code or once we build this out ourselves. So let's do this now. All right, so here we have that exact same piece of code. I'm going to make this a little bit larger. And we can see that we define this class word here. And this is our init method. And a method is just a function in the context of a class. And here we are assigning word to self.word, and then we calculate the length. And then this is the reverse, the reverse method in which we use this little clever trick here to reverse that. So now by running this, we are creating this blueprint. So we now have this blueprint that we can use to create words. Now in the following, we're going to create that first word. So we are going to create a new word and we are assigning word, the class that we've just created to this. And we're going to instantiate this with cat. And then cat is going into word here. Then this is going to be assigned to self.word. And then later on, if we do this reverse thing here, we will see that this is actually being reversed. So now that we run this, we now have created our new word. And now we can have a look at this. So we can now access these so-called attributes using this dot notation here. And let's do this. If we run this, I've already done it, we can see cat and three. So three would be the length. So now we can also look at the reverse method here. So first of all, we run this method. And what does this do? So it replaces self.word with the reverse of self.word. So let's do this. And as you can see, it prints tag. Um, so cat, but backwards. And now, of course, we could also create a secondary word. So that's the whole idea here. So we could now go dog equals word dog. This now instantiates a new object of that class. And now we can have a look at dog or we can just print that. If we do this, you'll see that nothing really works because we have to access the attributes. So we can do dog.word and this will just print dog. And now just as the one above, we can just use our methods here. So we could reverse and then do dog dot the word, run this. And now you will see that we have God, which is just dog reversed.
So this works really, really well. And this allows us to create these classes. A second really important new concept to learn are so-called list comprehensions. And these are extremely powerful and fairly unique to Python. They are complicated the first few times you do them, but once you've tried this a couple of times, it becomes second nature almost. So the idea here would be in this little example that we have a list of numbers here up top, 10, 20, 30. And now we want essentially a new list that has each of these numbers, but times 10. Now we could write uh, what you can see here to the right, a for loop where we go for n in numbers, and then we create a new empty list. And then to this new empty list, we essentially append n times 10. And we could do this, we can loop through this, and this will give us this new list times 10, in which we then have 100, 200, and 300. Instead of doing this, we can use a list comprehension. And that list comprehension, if you think about it, is just a for loop in one line. So we can do n times 10 for n in numbers, just in one line. And that is the list comprehension. And this will just give us a new list in one line that does everything we want it to do. So here we can see the same example in our code. So we have the numbers 10, 20, 30. We have then times 10, n times 10 for n in numbers. Let's run this and see what happens. And this will give us 100, 200, 300. And now we could easily, of course, do uh, n times 15, for example, and this would change this. So this is just a handy shortcut for more complicated loops, for example. Of course, this is uh, just a shortcut. Um, everything you can do using list comprehensions, you can do some other way, but it is a very handy feature and it makes your code often a little bit more legible and it allows you to do things like this very quickly. We can also do this for lists of lists. So here we have our trusty list of lists, our lol, <laughs> with um, three lists in it. And these are A1, B2, C3. So let's imagine that we want only the first element of this. So one, two, three. Now, of course, we could again write a for loop that goes through this list of lists and does this for us. But we can also use our list comprehension to do this. So to get only the first element, not the zeroth element, that would be ABC, but the first element, we do only first elements. And then we have these brackets, that's the, that's the, that's the notation for list comprehensions. And we do the first element of N for N in LOL. So for each N could be anything really in this list of lists, take the first one and create a new list out of that. And that is then one, two, and three. And we can see this here where this actually works really nicely. Now, list comprehensions can get even more complicated. And I just wanna show you one little example here. We're not really going to use this down below, but it's interesting. So you could now also use conditionals in here. So you could go n1 for n in lists of lists. And now you could do, for example, if n1 is greater than one. You know, if we run this, we get only two and three. So you can also add conditionals in here. So you have a for loop and then you also have a conditional, an if statement here, and you can use this to almost filter your lists to your desire. Very, very useful concept. Actually relatively easy if you think about it in terms of loops and in terms of conditions, but the notation is a bit more complicated and you need to uh, try this a couple times in order to really get it. All right, so let's look at another interesting feature and that's enumerate. And by the way, I am fully aware that I'm running through a couple of concepts here that are all quite complicated. And it's just a first introduction, but once you go through these exercises yourself and you play with these notebooks, these will make a lot more sense. I just want to show these to you once so that down the line, you're not too overwhelmed when we use these concepts. So enumerate is very handy because it allows us to, as the name suggests, go through, for example, a list or go through something that we can iterate over and then assign values uh, in doing this. So the way to do this is for index, and that could be anything, you could say for i or for number, comma, value, in, and now use enumerate as a function, and then you plug the list or the iteratable 
in here. So for index comma value in enumerate L, print index and value, and now you get 0a, 1b, 2c. So now each of the values in the list, a, b, c, gets also a number or an index to it that we can then use. So let's look at this briefly in code. That is in our notebook. And here we have that um, same example. So we have this list, a, b, c, then for index, comma, value, and enumerate l, print index, comma, value, and this works. And just so that you see that index is not a magic word here, we could do just an underscore here, and then print underscore, um, comma, value, and this works the same way. And this is very handy if you, for example, need to keep track of which item in a list you're looking at, or if you then do a secondary loop or something like that. So fairly handy, uh, very useful. You'll see how we use this um, in a second when we go into the exercises. Another extremely useful tool that in terms of using it is extremely simple, but what it does behind the scenes is, is quite interesting, is FTFY, uh, which has been developed by Robin Spear. And I'm just showing this to you um, because it is an issue that comes up all the time when working with text, so just so that you have this in your tool belt. And FTFY essentially fixes Unicode. So the important function here in this library is fix text. You give fix text some broken Unicode and it will magically fix it. And it actually works in most cases. It's an extremely powerful and wonderful tool that uh, just can save your day if you have any issues. So let's see how this looks like in our notebook. So as you can see, we have a Unicode string here, and here we have some apparent issues, and then we have no problem. This could be any Unicode text, and with Unicode, sometimes, especially if you encode from one format to the other, so you get a text document, for example, a corpus in Unicode, but for some reason, some of the files um, have been encoded differently. Sometimes there are these issues, or you've downloaded some text from the internet, and then something is off. This happens all the time. Now, FTFY, um, as I've shown you in the slides, simply magically fixes this. So if you run this, you can see that we now get no problems with the correct, um, in this case, it's an emoji, um, the tick mark here, it has been fixed. And this works wonders. So whenever you run into problems um, with Unicode, remember that you have this tool available to you. Let's look at two more things before we go into the exercises. And for these two, I'm not going to show you code examples now, at least not in the notebook, but this will come up later. But I just want to give you this now so that when we look at the exercises, you already have an idea. First, let's look at pandas. And pandas, as I've said before, is a powerful um, data analysis and manipulation tool or library. It is uh, used in more or less any data science project in Python. And you can think of this, if you, if you really want, as sort of an Excel spreadsheet type thing within Python, but a lot more powerful. The key component of this are so-called data frame objects. And data frames are tables. Um, tables as you know them, <laughs> more or less, but you can do very powerful things with them. So for example, here you can see uh, a data frame. Um, and in this data frame or in this table, we have documents uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3. We have given them an index. Every data frame has an index that refers to individual rows within that table. And then we have two columns here, tokens and sentiments. Well, technically we have three columns and the first column or the zeroth column is the index so document, token, and sentiment. And then within pandas, we have axes one and this refers to the rows. We have axes zero and that refers to the columns. Now we can create such a table using PD for a pandas and then data frame. And what's interesting is here, you can, for example, also load in Excel spreadsheets, you can load in CSV files. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty useful. But what's even more important is that we can now use functions on these tables or on the data within the table. So for example, we can access the tokens column here, and then we can quickly get the mean for this by just doing data frame tokens dot mean, and this will just give us the mean for all of the tokens within that document. Now, something else we've already used in this workshop is text directory. So this is just a refresher. So text directory, and we're going to use this as a library that is useful when working with multiple text files that live within one directory. So a very simple corpus often, or simple corpora usually work like this. And we can then use this to filter files based on, for example, 
uh, criteria such as length or, um, or content. And we can also run transformations on them. So a transformation, for example, would mean that I want all the text within this corpus in lowercase. Um, so I want to first select specific texts uh, from a corpus, and then I want to transform these. And you can run multiple transformations. So here's an example. So we load a folder that contains uh, Wikipedia articles. Then we filter by random sampling. There are a number of filters available. So we want 10. Then we stage a transformation, transformation to lowercase, and then we aggregate all of these into one text. So what this does is we start off with a folder that has Wikipedia articles in it. Then we select 10 of these files. Then we transform all of the text into lowercase, and then we put the 10 articles into one large string that we then can work on, and that is then stored in text. And this is uh, fairly useful when we work with this. And we're going to use this in the exercises. All right, so let's start with exercise 8, concordancer. The task is write a basic concordancer that can generate concordances based on a given file and a given search term. If you want to challenge yourself, try to format the concordances in quick format, so keywords and context. And for this, we're going to do two solutions. The first one is going to be a regex-based approach. So we will use a regular expression. We will find all instances of the search term, 25 characters before that, 25 characters after that, or left and right, and we don't display this to the user. And then we're also going to implement a token-based solution or token-based approach. Here, we will tokenize the text first, then we will define a window or span in terms of tokens, words, instead of just characters, because that is a bit more aligned with how most corpus linguistic tools work. And then we will generate a left and right window, which we can then use to print our quick concordances. All right, so let's go into solving this exercise. Before we can do any concordancing, we need to get some text that we can work on. And to do this, we are going to leverage text directory and we are going to get some Wikipedia articles. And I'm just going to copy paste this in here um, so that I don't have to necessarily type it out. So we can straight up run this. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use text directory, as you can see here, and we're going to leverage the Wikipedia data that is available to us. So this just gives us um, a text directory object with the Wikipedia texts that we have in data. And now we can use those, so wikipedia.getText, and let's just get the zeroth or the first article. And this is just a Wikipedia article on Cologne in English. And we will be using this as our dummy text or as our playground text to build our concordancers. As you can see, I've switched over to a tool for writing regular expressions, regxr.com, and we're going to use this to build our regular expression before we are going to do any coding. So the idea, as I introduced before, is that we are going to write a regular expression that finds instances of our search term, and then we are going to take a few characters to the left and a few characters to the right in order to display that. So let's start with our search term. Let's say our search term is city. We can do this and just type this in here. And then we see that this is marked in our text here. And now we need to find context to the left and context to the right. So we want to find these instances, but also with a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right. So we're going to look for anything and everything first of all to the left, and let's go 0 to 25, and then we want city, right? And then we also need to go to the right. So let's add a backslash b here for a boundary, and then go 25. Now, this seems to work relatively nicely, but we also need to account for the fact that city could be at the beginning of a line or at the end. So we do an or, and we do, not Cody, but city, uh, then the boundary, and then zero to 25, just to account for the fact that it could be somewhere else. 
or that it could be that city could be positioned within the text at a different at a different spot that we wouldn't get with our first regular expression or with the first half of our regular expression. So let's see if this works. So for example, here in line one, city and then to the left and then to the right. Um, we can also look at another example. Here we have city and then to the left and then to the right. So this looks this looks quite nice. Okay. So let's look at how we can implement this in Python. I've used some movie magic to already build up our workbook a little bit more. So I've added this here. And just as a side note, I'm not going into too many details here with regards to regular expression. If you're interested in that, have a look at the other video that specifically deals with that. So this is what this could look like. So we get our text, Wikipedia Cologne, that's the first text as we did before. Then we're going to create our regular expression. We are going to compile this regular expression. We don't necessarily have to do this, but it is good practice. That's the one that you've just seen or that we've just tried out. Then we're going to get our concordances by using re.findall. So we're going to find all instances of our regular expression within our Wikipedia text. Let's see if this works. And this looks quite nice. So we get our concordances, largest city on the Rhine, Cologne is largest city of Germany. This looks quite nice. So one thing that we could do to make this a little bit more nice is we could take our search term and take our window and make these variables so that we can use this as a concordance or as it is intended to be. So let's add two variables here, search term, is city and then let's do our left and right and say this is 25. And now we have to modify our regular expression and this is going to look a little bit complicated because we are now going to use both f, both f strings and regular expressions. So for this to work we first need to escape our brackets here so we will make double brackets out of this because in f strings Python would interpret this as a placeholder for something that we want. Um, and we're going to circumvent that by using double brackets in this case. So let's do this here. And now just as with regular F strings, we can replace city with search term because we want our search term here and we need to do this twice. So let's do search term here and search term there. And now we also want to replace 25 or instance of 25 with LR. And then we need to do it here as well and we need to do it here as well. And now let's see if this actually works. That looks good. And now we should be able to change our left and right to let's say five. Okay, that looks good. And instead of city, we could do for example, Cologne. Let's see if this works. And that seems to be working fine. So now we have a Concordance that works, it's not really pretty, but it does the job really, really well. So now we're going to look at the second solution and that is the token-based approach. To do so, we need to introduce two more concepts that we're going to use in the solution. I'm going to do just uh, briefly using these slides here. The first thing we need to understand is the join statement. And with the join, we can turn an iterable into a string again. So let's say we have a list of tokens. The cat is gray. This is an iterable. I've used the term before. An iterable is just a sequence that can be iterated over. So essentially, if you have something that you can run a for loop on, that's an iterable. And now we can use join to make a string out of that. So for example, here, string one equals nothing dot join tokens. The cat is gray. Or you could use, well, nothing, a space character. Or as to a dash dot join tokens, the dash cat dash is dash gray. So basically you take all of the elements of an iterable and then you join them together using a character you've defined. In S1, I've used a space character. In S2, I've used a dash character. So how does this work? Let's assume that we have our string or text tokenized. So we have a list, the cat is gray and likes mice. We also have our search word, which is gray. And now let's assume that for the position of gray for our search word within our tokenized text, we have an index and we call this index ID, all right? We also have our left and right 
window size. And now we can use slicing to construct the left and right context. So our search word is middle, ID. And now we can use slicing to get the left and the right context as is shown here. So for example, for the left, we do text tokenized ID. So that would be the position of gray minus our left, right window size up until ID. So that would be three or now for the right context, we do ID plus one because we want one word to the right. So it would be ID, which is three plus one. And then we go until ID plus LR. So that would be up until five, right? So then we have cat is gray and likes two to the left, two to the right. So let's now look at how we implement this in Python. And again, I've copy pasted a couple of solutions in here so that we have a good starting point with which we can experiment. So first of all, we need to tokenize our text. And for this, I've added a very simple tokenizer here. And this is a regular expression based tokenizer um, that matches on these backslash W characters. So we can try this and it is really, really simple, but it should work fine for our use case here. And we will use this uh, many times down the line in other exercises. So we can use this tokenize, then we give it a string and it will give us back a list with our tokens. Just as an example, this approach has its limits. So if you look at this, you will see that if we tokenize, this is a data driven approach, we will get this is a data driven approach. Now we could argue whether that is what we want, but most likely we would want this is a data driven as one token approach. And we can achieve those, for example, by modifying our regular expression like this. And if we run this again, you will see that it actually matches on that. However, we only now solved one problem and not all of the problems. So just keep that in mind. If we use something very simple like this, there will be limitations and that's the reason why in real life applications, we usually would use a library to do something like this that has safeguards, um, we could call them uh, against things like that. Usually these are based on language models. Later down the line, we will use Spacey, which has language models, for example, for English that help us with tokenizing. Of course, there are many other ways of doing this, but this now just works as an example. And I just wanted to demonstrate that we can we can modify this. Okay, so let's go into building the concordancer. Let's start with a rather simple solution, or not just a simple solution, but the most basic way of building this, following what we've looked at in the slide deck. So in this first line, we are going to tokenize our Wikipedia article about Cologne. So we're going to use tokenize Wikipedia Cologne, and then we're going to define a variable for a search word, which is city, and for a left and right context. And keep in mind, in contrast to our first solution, we are now thinking in terms of tokens or in terms of words, not in terms of characters. So the 25 up top were characters. Now this is, this is now focusing on tokens. So now we're going to do a for loop. And this is maybe looking a little bit scary, but we are going to think through it. So for ID, that's going to be a number in range of the length of the tokenized text. So we're going through every single token or every single position in that text. If Wikipedia Cologne tokenized ID, so that is if the word we're looking at in the loop is the search word, we're going to do something, right? So here we are detecting whether we have found the search term we are looking for. If this happens, we are going to create our quick line, our keyword and context line. And we're going to do this by using join. And remember, join creates a string out of an iterable and the exact thing, the exact slicing we've discussed in the slide deck. And then we're going to print that quick for each and every finding we have. Now we can look at the output. Cologne is the largest city of Germany's most and the fourth most populous city in Germany with slightly. So this looks quite, this looks quite, quite well. Let's experiment a little bit with this so that we understand what's actually happening. So to do this, let us do the following. Let's print in the for loop the ID. 
just that we get a feeling for this. So now our output looks a little bit different, but if we scroll all the way up, we can see that we are moving up through our text. So 0, 1, 2, 3. And these correspond to the tokens in our string. And now having the index, we can, of course, refer to our tokenized text because this is just a list. And remember, we can refer to items in a list using an index. So instead of printing the ID, we could now use Wikipedia clone tokenized and then just use this ID here and just print this. And this, of course, now prints the text as it is, well, in our string or in our, in our file. And this allows us to then compare this to our search word here. So this is how this works. And that's how we generate this concordance, these concordance lines here. Now to make this a little bit prettier, we can construct the left and right side independently of each other. So everything looks more or less the same. We have a search word, we have the left and right context. I uh, did not put the text up here. We're just using the same text. And then we have an empty list for our quick here. Now we're doing the same thing. So, so far it's the same thing. We are going through our text. We are looking for positions in which the word is the search word. But now instead of just generating the whole quick line as one, as we did before, we are doing this for the left and for the right context independently, just as we did this in the slide deck. And this is what happens here. For us to be able to print this more um, in a more more user-friendly or in a prettier way, we're going to append each finding to our quick list up here. So we're going to quick append, and then we're going to create a new list. So it's going to be a list of lists where we have the left context, then we have the search word, and then we have the right context. And then ultimately, we're going to use tabulate, and tabulate is another library that we can use to tabulate or print lists in tabulated format. So let's run this and let's see what happens. And now we have a fairly neat concordancer, quick view concordancer, that prints the search term in the middle and then our left context and then our right context. Just the same way as above, but by splitting this up and by generating this list of lists, we are able to uh, leverage tabulate to demonstrate or to, to display this in a neater format. This also allows us now to sort our concordances, which is extremely helpful. So as we now have a list of lists, we can use Python's sort option to do this. And I'm going to show this to you. So here we are first sorting our quicks, our findings. Remember the quick list of lists now contains all of our concordance or findings. We can sort these before printing it. So we can sort it and we are going to use this little neat trick here and this goes beyond the scope of this workshop but we can use this to define what we want to what we want to sort for so in a sub key in a sub key would be the item within a list that is within a list of lists in any way we now have a sorted quick quick view for our search term and then left context and right context very neat solution all right, so for exercise nine, we are going to extract n-grams from a string. So the task is, write a function that produces all n-grams based on a given text file and an n. Hint, the NLTK provides a fairly easy solution to generating n-grams. That's exactly what we're going to do. So for our first solution, we're going to go with the NLTK approach, and we just are going to straight up using their n-gram method. And then in the second part, we're going to rely on plain old Python and we are going to generate the n-grams or extract the n-grams ourselves. And for that, we need to know that the number of n-grams will be the number of tokens in the text plus one minus n. And once we know how many n-grams there are, we can create a loop that appends the n-grams, which we will get by slicing the tokenized texts to a list of n-grams. And finally, we are also going to try to use ChatGPT to generate a solution for that, just so that we can see how this would work. Okay, so as a first step, we will need some text. 
And while the task requires us to use a file, we're just going to use a string here. Um, I really like Python. It is pretty awesome to work on. We've seen above how we could read in files and work with this. So here we are going to cut it short. So this is going to be our text. So again, some movie magic. For the NLTK approach, we are going to write the following function. So it's going to be named NLTK ngrams, and it will take two arguments, the text and the n, as the question required us to do, or the task required us to do. First of all, we're going to tokenize our text again, and we use the same tokenize function as we did above. And then we will get the ngrams by essentially calling the NLTK ngrams function on our tokenized text and our n, and then we will also use list to force the output into a list, and then our function will return the list of n-grams. So we're just writing a so-called wrapper that is our own function around the NLTK function. And that should work quite nicely. So we can generate n-grams, we can change the n, so if we do two, so by grams, we would get that, get, let's get back to trigrams, it will look like this. All right, now this works really well, and this is what I would probably use in real life, but we can also do this ourselves. And to do this, we need to, again, remember that the number of n-grams will be the number of tokens plus one minus n. So for this text, I really like Python, it is pretty awesome. We can argue, if we look at trigrams, that we need six trigrams. So the way we do this, and it's pretty simple if you think about it, is we loop over our number of n-grams, we know that it's going to be six, and then for each, we're going to slice our tokenized text into the appropriate lengths, so three in this case. So as you can see in this table, the zeroth n-gram is going to be I really like, then we're going to look at really like Python, then we're going to look at like Python it, and then Python it is. And this way we will get all of the n-grams. And take a second to have a look at the slide and kind of play this through in your head. The underlying principle is relatively simple, but you need to play this through once um, to, to really grasp the idea. So now let's do this in code and then you can experiment with this, which really helps in understanding that. So here we have the ngram function in good old Python. And again, it takes a text and then it takes an n with a default argument of three. We're going to tokenize our text. Then we are going to determine the number of n-grams following this little formula here. And now we will also create an empty list for our n-grams. So now we will loop, we have a loop here, a for loop here, for the range of number of n-grams. So this is going to be uh, six for the um, trigrams. And then for each of these, we're going to append, just as we did in the slides, our n-gram to this list. And if we do this and now run this, we will be able to see these different n-grams here. And that works really, really well. Now, as promised, we will also have a look at now a third option, a more or less for demonstrative purposes, and we will try to use ChatGPT to solve this problem. So to speed things up, I've already started here, and I prompted ChatGPT to write a Python function that extracts ngram from a given text. So ChatGPT came back with, here's an example function that takes a list of tokens and returns the ngrams as lists of tuples. So we define get ngrams, takes a list of tokens and an n, it also creates an empty list for the n-grams. And then as we did, it loops over the range of the tokens minus n plus one, uh, but it does this in one step. So that's pretty much the same thing we did. And then this is again, exactly the same thing we did in our example. But it also provides us with an example of how we could use this function. So first of all, they take a text, then they tokenize that text, but they just use a simple split function which um, means that the text is tokenized by space characters, more or less. And then we would get an n-gram by calling the n-gram function with the tokens and uh, three for trigrams, and we would print the n-grams, 
And for this example, ChatGPT argues this would output that. And then I asked, what would this look like for text equals, I really like Python, it is pretty awesome. And it gave us some usage examples and the output which it believes this would do. So let's try this. Um, I mean, we are pretty sure that it works because we wrote very similar code, but for the sake of argument, let's just try it. So I copied over the code from chat GPT. At least it runs, that's good. And here I took the usage example that they provided. Let's run this. And as we can see, this seems to work really well. And as you can see, the output is pretty much the same. Well, it is the same as our plain old Python solution produced. Now, as you can see, we were able to leverage ChatGPT to come up with a solution for this. I personally think that this could have been written a little bit nicer. Um, of course, this was very compact, but as we did above, for example, this could be made more explicitly by, by putting this in its own thing and so on and so forth. But these tools are quite powerful, and I just wanted to take the chance to demonstrate that even with these fairly specific use cases, this is Corpus Linguistics, tools like this are able to produce a good starting point for us. Although at this point, you shouldn't necessarily trust what this does and really think this through. But in this case, this could have this could have really, really um, saved you some time and you could have used this to essentially finish your homework here. So keep that in mind. And I'm sure as these models progress, we will see even more powerful capabilities in the near future. So now let's move into exercise 10, frequency analysis. And for this exercise, we need to write a script that generates a frequency table for a given text. The list should contain all types and their frequencies. Hint, have a look at Python's counter capabilities. That's exactly what we're going to do for our first solution. So Python's counter is a very straightforward to use tool or function to count all elements in an iterable. So that's exactly what we want. Once we've done that, that's the straightforward uh, Pythonic approach. We will be using both NLTK as well as Spacey to do it. And for NLTK, we're going to use the frequency distribution function. And with Spacey, we're going to rely on Spacey documents. But we'll see that in a second. So before we go into the code, let's have a look at counter first. So as I said, counter can be used to count hashable or iterable objects. Technically, it's hashable objects. So for example, a list. And the resulting counter object, so counter Remember back to the classes, we initiate a counter object and then that counter object holds all the information that we want. And this counter object behaves a lot like a dictionary and it contains all the individual elements as well as their counts. So for example, here we have a list of numbers, one, one, two, three, three, four. Now we use this counter class to get a counts object or a counter object here, it's called counts. And then we can look for the individual elements. So for example, if we look for one, in our counts, in our counter object, which we call counts, we will get the number of elements, the count of them, which is two. If we were to look at four, we would get one and so on and so forth. Also, as this is an object, it has um, some methods. Remember back how we had the reverse method in our word class? One of these is most common. And with this, we can look at the most common elements in a counter. So now that we know this, Let's implement a frequency table in Python. So first of all, we need our file or our text. And here we are going to use the exact same Wikipedia text that we've used before. And as you can see here, I just copy pasted essentially the code from above. And I've also added this print statement here with which we can check how many tokens we have in our text. This reads now, there are five, uh, 405 tokens in Wikipedia Cologne, given our tokenizer that we've been using. Of course, if we were to use a different tokenizer, a different regular expression, we would get a different number of tokens. So again, with the movie magic, we will now look at the counter approach. And this first line here is the core component of it. So here we're going to use a counter on Wikipedia Cologne tokenized. So this is our iterable, and then we're going to get the most 10 most common items here. Now, just as a reminder, counter is not just available to us by default. We'll have to go up and we'll have a look in the environment section here. And then in my import statements, you can see that right here, we are doing a from collections import counter. So this class here 
is now available to us because we have imported it from collections. So just keep that in mind that sometimes we have to do this. All right, let's see how this works. So I'm going to run this. And now we will get the mo most common, 10 most common uh, words or tokens in this text file. So the, off and, cologne, city, in, is, and so on forth, so on and so forth. Um, more or less what we would expect. We can assume that this is also correct. Now, of course, we can also visualize this. And we haven't talked too much about visualization in Python. And this is not technically part of this workshop. So I'm not going to run you through this code in detail. But what we're going to use is a library called Seaborn here imported as SNS. And SNS allows you, or Seaborn allows you to plot or visualize things relatively easily. So if you're interested in that, have a look. So first, in this first line, we're going to do the same thing we did above, but we are going to use dict to turn our counter object into a dictionary object. And we're going to do this because Seaborn cannot deal with the counter object. So we have to do this. And then we're going to plug this into Seaborn and let's run this. And here we will get a relatively nice visualization of our frequency distribution. So again, we have the little bit over 50 and then it goes down, down to populous, at least for the top most uh, top, top 20, top 20 ones. Okay, so these are absolute frequencies. Of course, we're also interested in relative frequencies. And for that, we are first going to define a function that turns our absolute frequencies into relative frequencies. And this is fairly standard corpus linguistics stuff, but this is the way, how, or one way you could do it um, programmatically. So we're defining a function here. This function takes the absolute frequency and it takes the corpus size. And then we are going to return a rounded relative frequency. So absolute frequency divided by the corpus size times 10,000. So we are normalizing per 10,000 as this function is named. Of course, you could now also do a normalized function, a more general normalized function. So just if you were interested, you could do um, par n, for example, and then we would do absolute frequency corpus size and n, or k. And then, uh, of course, we could do something like this. So we just copy paste this and make this our n. And now we would have a more generalized a more generalized version of that if we wanted if we wanted that. Um, but here we're just going to work with the per 10,000 version of that. But just so you know, this is how you could do it. And of course, in a more general purpose scenario, this is this would be might might be what you want to do. And now we're going to do more or less the same thing as above. But Let's go through it. So first of all, we get our frequencies from our counter. This time, not just the most common ones, but all of them. And then we are going to get our corpus size. And here I decided to take all of the values in the counter object and sum them up. Alternatively, we could just have relied on our tokenized string and just got the length of that list. Same thing. Then. I create a empty dictionary. So remember, an empty list is just two, bra two, two of these, two brackets. And an empty dictionary is two of the curly brackets. Now we're going to do something that's a little bit more complicated, but it will make sense in a second. So before we look at this, let's run this once and see what it looks like. And then we're going to look at what happens here before, before we go through this loop here. F, remember, F is our dictionary counter. So we can have a look at this like that, and you will see what this looks like. So F holds all the tokens, or the types, I have to say, because here we have um, the types and then their uh, occurrences. So of course, uh, we have cologne, cologne as a token 18 times, and this is the type cologne, just to make sure. So we have the types and we have their frequency, their absolute frequency at this point. And now what we are going to do here is we're going to loop over all the items. So an item here is the type and its frequency. So we're going to loop over this. Here we are going to do it in a way in which we get both the word or the type and the absolute frequency in one go. So each loop 
we get the word, the type, and the absolute frequency from f. So in the first run of this loop, or in the first iteration of this loop, we will have colon as the word, or as the w, and we have 18 as the absolute frequency. And then we are going to populate our empty relative frequency dictionary using our per 10k function. So we are adding an element to our dictionary, and this is going to be named with the type, and then it will be assigned the relative frequency which we get. So that's how we populate this relative frequencies dictionary. I'm going to delete that, and then the output will look like something like this. So in relative frequencies, the type cologne now has a frequency of 356. So cologne appears 356 times per 10,000 in this document. And if you are interested in more on that, have a look at the frequency distribution dictionary. Uh, not, not dictionary, have a look at the frequency distribution notebook. So now that we've done this the manual way, let's have a look at the NLTK approach. And NLTK has this frequency distribution class in its probability module, and we can use this to get our frequencies. So let's just run this. Of course, nothing happened because our frequencies are now in frequencies, but we can have a look at them. And here we're going to use the pprint, uh, preprint function. And this will look like this. So we will get the off and, and it looks very much the same as our counter object, which is good. And now we can also use this very similarly again to a dictionary to retrieve frequencies for an individual type. So if we want to look at the, we can do this, we get 53, that works really well. Now, in comparison to what we did before, the freakdist class, and now our freakdist object frequencies, has some very helpful features to deal with corpus linguistic questions. Here's a fun example. Let's say we want to look at hapax legomena. So these are items that only appear once in our text or corpus. We can simply do this. And here I'm also only getting the first 10. So we get federal, state, fourth most, slightly, and so on and so forth. Really, really cool. Have a look at the documentation um, to see all of the different methods available. And we can also very easily plot our frequencies, for example, like this. It's not going to be the most pretty plot ever, but it is quite helpful. So here we get our accounts. Well, in the notebook, it really looks not very nice, but you can see how the frequency distribution happens. These are all of the words, and we can also see, as expected, a Zipfian distribution, more or less, here. You don't actually know what a Zipfian distribution is necessarily, but if you are in, into uh, quantitative uh, linguistics, uh, you will probably have seen such a plot before. By the way, as I said, it is worthwhile to look at the documentation. So this is the NLTK documentation, just so you've seen one of these at least once. And in here, so we are now in the FreakDisk uh, freak disk documentation. And once you look at these, um, at the first time, these, these look a little bit scary, but we can do it, go down here and then we will get all of the different methods that we have available to us. So we've already looked at hapaxes, right? But there are many others. So for example, we can get max, and then it tells us what this is. Return the sample with the greatest number of outcomes to this frequency distribution, okay. Plot, we've also done uh, tabulate the given samples from the, pre from the frequency distribution, okay. Copy, print, we've already printed it as well. Elements, and then we can get some, we can get most common ones. So you can see that there are many ways of interacting with this. So let's maybe try one, let's try to tabulate one. So I've just taken this here and let's run this. And this will get us a sort of table format for our frequency distribution. And finally, we are going to look at our spacey approach. And spacey is most likely the most commonly used library, not necessarily in research applications, but in real life NLP slash corpus linguistics computational applications. And for spacey, I'm just going to briefly introduce you to some of the core terminology so that this will make more sense, especially as we'll be using spacey down the line. So in spacey, 
we start with documents, or we usually talk about documents, well, and languages. But we'll have a look at this here. So a spacey document or a spacey doc, that's the class or the object then, is a sequence of token objects. This will make sense in a second. Above the document, so to speak, we have a language, a language object. A language, in the sense of spacey, has both a vocab, and this vocab contains lexeme objects, and the vocabulary contains all the lexemes as well as other shared data. So here to the right, you can see roughly how this works. So we import spacey. Here, first, we define a language. And defining a language in the world of spacey means that we usually, usually load a language model, a pre-trained language model. You could train your own language models, but that's way beyond the scope of this. So we load an English model here, and that makes available to us the language. And you can see here, I'm printing the type of that object. You can always do this, and then you see what it is. And the language here now is a spacey language, English, English. Now, we can look for lexemes in the vocabulary of that language. So here I'm getting a lexeme, and we are doing this by accessing the vocab within the language, and then we can use get item that's specific to spacey, the lexeme for hello, and we will get that back. And then the lexeme object has a couple of attributes and properties, so for example, the text, but also a number or an ID referring to that. So here we have this lexeme object. Now that we have a language and that language has lexemes and a vocabulary, we can create a document. And to create a document, we will be utilizing the language. So we will, so to speak, give the language a string or a text, and then this will generate the document. So here we get a spacey document. And that's where it gets really, really interesting because in the context of a document, linguistic properties are being assigned to each token in the text using the language model. So once we've done that, we can, for example, get information about the parts of speech and about syntactic relations within our document. Beyond the document, or the document consists of token objects, and that's the final piece here, we can get now individual tokens from a document. And these tokens hold, as I said, this information, hold linguistic information determined by the language model. But that's something we will look at in more detail later. Here, we will be using the documents to get frequency distributions. So this is going to look a little bit complicated, but you'll see that it makes sense. So first, we are getting our language. We are going to use spacey load, and we're going to load in that English model. Now, instead of language, I called it NLP, and that is due to the standard way of doing this in the spacey world. So in, in spacey world, usually NLP refers to the language we're currently working in for natural language processing. And then we are going to generate a document, not generate, but we get the document using our model. And now we are going to do something interesting. Now we're going to get our frequencies and we're going to do this by using the count by method of our document. And we're going to count by the attributes or we are going to count by by specific attributes, and that is ORT. And that is the ID of, uh, of an item in our vocabulary. So this will give us numbers, but as you've seen before, these numbers rely back to specific objects in our vocabulary. This sounds very complicated, but you will see that it makes sense. So now if we print our frequencies, instead of a word or a legible word, we will get this ID number, and then we will get a frequency. And this is just the internal representation of the items within our document. If we have the index of a given word, so the entry in the vocabulary, we can easily retrieve the text like this. So we are now referring to the vocabulary in the document and we are looking up in this, you can think of it like a dictionary, we're looking up the ID and then we get the text and this is that. And now to make this more legible, we are going to do this for all items in our frequency table. So as before, we are going to have a for loop that gets the vocab index, this is that number, or a number like this, and the count in our frequencies. And then for each of these, we're going to make this human readable by performing this little trick that we've done above, and then we're going to print this. And if we do this, we will get this list here, and this looks like a frequency distribution, just as we did before. And that is a very handy way of doing this. 
this definitely does not utilize Spacey to its fullest extent, but we're going to see what Spacey can do at a later point in a later exercise. So now we've reached exercise 11, and this is all about computing basic statistics. So the task for this exercise is write a script that generates the following statistics for a given search term and a set of files, a corpus. So we're working on a corpus now, and we want the absolute and relative frequencies, the mean frequency, the standard deviation. Also try to plot the frequency distribution across files. And we're going to do, well, one and a half solutions here. So first, for our basic approach, we will define two functions for getting the absolute and relative frequency of a given text. We've almost done this before. And then we are using a third function to generate the frequencies for a number of texts, so for the whole corpus, and we will store this in a list. And finally, we will then use Python statistics functions to get the required statistics. Once we've done that, we will move into pandas and use a more sophisticated, but also more standardized data frame approach. So after getting the vocabulary, and we will talk about this in a second of the corpus, we will use one of the functions from above to populate frequency tables. And we will then create data frames from these tables and then run our statistics of these. Before we can go into that, I want to introduce two concepts, that of um, vocabulary, but before that even, that of lists and sets and a neat little trick that we can use before we go into the actual code. So the first um, idea I want to introduce, because we're going to use this, is lists and sets. So you already know lists, but we haven't really worked with sets. So sets in the mathematical sense are well-defined collections of distinct elements. And that's the point here. These are distinct elements. So a neat little trick in Python or any programming language that you can apply is if you have a list with items, let's think about tokens here, and you only want the unique things in that list, you can just turn that list into a set because the set can only have distinct elements. And that's a neat little trick to get only the unique elements within a list. So while they can be used for many things, especially if you're doing set theory, we will use them to turn a list of tokens that necessarily, well, not necessarily, but most likely contains duplicates into a set of types. Now, the other important thing is this notion of a vocabulary. And we've already briefly touched upon this when we talked about Spacey, but now we will do it more explicitly. So in natural language processing, it is extremely common to store the vocabulary, and that is essentially the set of types in a specific data structure or in a data structure that is separate from everything else. And we do this to avoid duplication, but also to reduce memory cost. If we have the vocabulary stored somewhere else or in a, in a separate data structure, we can just refer to indices in this vocabulary to build up, for example, sentences. So here's a simple example. We have a vocabulary and that vocabulary contains the types they, gray, cat is black. Each of these has an index. And now if you want to build a sentence, we can just refer to our vocabulary. And this sentence here would read the cat is black. So just referring to that table. And you can think of this as a lookup table. And this allows us to, to do that fairly efficient. Now, the same principle can also be applied to storing frequencies. For example, if we have the vocabulary as above, we can, of course, build up documents or sentences. Here, I built a document, the cat is gray, the cat is black. But you can also use this for frequencies. And so we can store the frequencies for a specific type numerically in a table. And that's something we're going to leverage. So we are not going to have the, at least, at least from a certain point on, or onwards, we will not have the word or the type in characters, but we will just have a reference to our vocabulary and then the frequency. And this is a lot of benefits, as I said, but the most important one is that we don't have to store in memory the actual world word all the time. So now we are in our notebook and we will start this off by getting our corpus ready. And for this exercise, we're going to use the HUM19 UK corpus. We are going to leverage text directory again using these three lines here. And more specifically, we are going to filter by random sampling. So we want 10, 10 documents and we don't really care because this is an exercise. So we take 10 random ones and we are also going to lowercase all of this text. And this is how text directory works. If you remember back to the beginning of this video, we looked at that. And then just to check 
Well, first of all, we transform to memory, and then we're also going to print the aggregation so that we can check what we have. And as you can see here, we have uh, our 10 files here, referring to years within that corpus, and then we have some information about the characters and the tokens, and then we have the transform text, and as you can see, all of this is lowercase because we ran the transformation lowercase transformation. Let's start with our basic approach. So here we have it. And first of all, we will write a function that helps us to get the frequencies. So basically we wanna replicate what we did above to get a frequency table. And here we will do the tokenization just within that function. This is relatively convenient for us here because we don't have to think about it. However, that is not really efficient and usually you would probably split this up as I put in the text here. But what this function basically does is, is tokenizes the text that we plug in here. It then uses the counter approach to get the frequency table and it returns that frequency table to us. Now, an important note is that the counter has an additional nice property because the counter object will return zero if the element is not present. So we can try this here. So we have a test text, the cat is black. And now if we get the frequency, uh, the frequency for a cat, we will get one. And if we get the frequency for dog, we will get zero. And this is really, really nice because this allows us to not having to think about whether something is present or not present in our frequency table, because if it is not present, we will just get a zero. Now we need the relative frequency, the absolute frequency we have via our table. And as we pointed out above, we will use the exact same approach. We will use a relative frequency. This is the exact same function as above. Above, we called it per 10k to be a little bit more explicit. It does the same thing. And now comes the interesting bit because we want frequencies across multiple texts, not just one text or one string as we did above. So what we do here is in this function, we first define an empty list for our frequency list. And now we loop over all of the texts. So this function will take a number of texts or a number of strings. And for each of these texts, we will use the get frequency function to get the frequency table. And then we will append this table for the search term. So just a frequency for that search term to our frequency list. So let's run this so that we have this available. And now we will write the same function for this. Well, let's try this first just for an example so that we understand how this works. So here I've created a little dummy example. So we have texts and these are three texts. And the first text just test, test, test. The second one is test, test, and the third is test. And now we wanna get the frequency across texts for our search term test, very simple case. So we would expect us to return three for the first, two for the second, and one for the last one. So let's run this. And this is exactly what we get here. All right, now that we know that this works, we also want a similar function to get the relative frequencies. So same thing, but this time, so we start off the same way, but this time we will get the corpus size. Well, in this, size, in this case, it is the text size. And then we are going to use our relative frequency function just as above to get the relative frequencies. Aside from that, this works exactly the same. Now, you might wonder whether we could have done this in one go, and absolutely. So we could have created a frequency function that provides us both the absolute and the relative frequency in one go, but I wanted to keep it relatively simple here um, so that, that we can understand this. Also, generally speaking, it is advisable to have more or less single purpose functions or functions that do one thing and do it really well, because that makes debugging a whole lot easier. So if you run into problems, and you have smaller functions, it is a lot easier to figure out what, what went wrong here. So let us continue. Now, the for, for the first time, we're going to really use a list comprehension. And we're going to use this to get our texts. So this list of texts, remember here, we just had test, 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 and test. We want this for the corpus. And we're going to use this to get these texts from our aggregation from our aggregation from text directory. So we are going to take the transformed text for each document in our aggregation. Now, if we scroll up, we will understand this. This is our aggregation and our aggregation has the transformed text in it. These are the documents. So for each document, we're just going to take the transformed text. We are not interested in the file name. We're not interested in the characters and so on. We're just interested in the text. 
So we are taking that. And this is what this does. So this will give us these texts. We could also have a look at it. So if we run this, we will get all of the text in these files. But let's get rid of this and now focus on the statistics that we want to do. First of all, we want to get the frequencies across texts. And these are the absolute frequencies. So we're going to use our function and we are going to look for the word shock. So we're going to run this. Ran, oh, apparently it ran fine. Then we do the same thing for the relative frequencies. You're using the other function. And something went wrong. Oh, I forgot to actually run this, so it wasn't available in our environment. Okay, let's run this again. Yep, that seemed to work. And now, as we have these available to us, and let's just have a look inside them, so to speak. So let's take this and maybe let's just look at zero to five so that we get an idea. And now we have our relative frequencies for shook across these texts as a list, right? And an important note here is this list obviously has no knowledge about what text or what document in the corpus it refers to. So this is just the list. So we need to keep that in mind that the frequencies are calculated in the same order as the documents are in our aggregation. We could solve this by using a dictionary instead of a list and storing the document with uh, the document for this frequency alongside it, but we don't actually need it because we know the files associated with this. And also for the statistics that we're going to calculate, it doesn't really matter what document it comes from. So we don't need to store that information and it is more efficient to just use a list. All right, so let's get rid of this. And now we go into the actual statistics. So we want the mean, the standard deviation, and we also want the mean for the relative, um, for the relative frequencies, just as three examples here. And to do this, we can simply use Python statistics, um, statistics library. And if we run this, we will get a statistics.mean, so the mean for the raw frequencies, 14.2 for these texts, we can get the standard deviation which is 14.19. Uh, and we can also get the mean for the relative frequencies, which is 1.45. So per 10,000 that is. So now, as I said before, we are going into a more complicated approach using pandas data frames and a vocabulary approach as outlined in the slides. So we start again by taking our text, tokenizing it, and we are now getting our vocabulary first. And to do this, we're going to utilize this set trick. So this tokenized text now right here is just the whole text, the whole corpus tokenized. It's a long list of tokens. For the vocabulary, we want only the types. And to get the types, we will turn the list of tokens into a set. And now we can have a look at the vocabulary and we can see that the length of our vocabulary is about 40,000 um, 40, types. And now if we wanted to, because now we are in set world, we could also turn our set and sets are by nature not sortable. So we could take our set and turn that back into a list. And that would allow us to sort the list and to work with that. And it's actually quite helpful to, to do that. So let's do this and see what it looks like. And now we can order or sort our vocabulary. We did this here and have a look and in, look into the vocabulary. So here we take the 20th thousands, uh, element and then go 10 up. And we can see here, uh, Lauren, Larry, Larry, Larynx, and so on. Um, we have a sorted vocabulary here. Importantly, within that vocabulary, every single thing only appears once. It's, it's the types. And now we can use this to refer to our individual words or types. Now, if you think back, all the way back to when we talked about Spacey, Spacey does a very similar thing. And in Spacey, both the language as well as the document has a vocabulary, Re relatively similar to this, but their vocabulary contains a lot more information than just the, uh, the type itself, the type written in characters. Okay, next step, we're going to initialize two frequency tables. So we will have a frequency table for the absolute frequencies and one for the relative frequencies. Again, we will separate these out. We will not do this in one step, but instead of lists, this time we are going to use dictionaries. 
Now we are going to do some looping again, and we are going over every single document in the aggregation. And for each of the documents, we will get the document frequencies using our get frequencies function from above. And then we will create two empty lists. So for each document, we will take two empty lists. And this is now very similar to the approach from above. But now for each of the words in our vocabulary, that's important for each of the words in our vocabulary, we will find the frequencies, relative and absolute, for that word. And then ultimately, we are going to append this, these frequencies to our frequency table, which contains the frequencies for all the documents, both relative and absolute. So here we are doing this. We have separate functions, but we will have in the end one frequency table that has all the information. Uh, not one, but we have two for the absolute and the relative, but each will hold the frequencies for all files. And here we will also have the association between file names and the frequencies. So let's run this and then we will look at the output and then it will make uh, a lot more sense. So before we go on, let's just have a look into the frequency table absolute. Just have a look here and we can run this. And now you will see it's a very, very, very long output. And it is a bit in unintuitive, but you'll see. So we go up here and now we see. So for the file 1827, this, these are our frequencies, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. These are the frequencies for all words in our vocabulary, right? So we, we do this vocabulary based. So the zero word in our vocabulary appears zero times in 1827. Now the advantage of this approach is that we know the frequencies for each document based off the vocabulary. So we also know what's not there. With the other approach, we only count what's in the specific text. And here we are also looking for all the items that are in the vocabulary, but not necessarily in this specific, in this specific text. Okay, let's go on. Now we can use a data frame or we will generate a pandas data frame out of our frequency table. And we use the vocabulary as the index. And this will give us a rather neat little table to work with. And here you can see to the left, all of the, well, here it's just the top, uh, top five, but technically all of them are in there. You can see all of the entries in our vocabulary. And then on in the columns, you can see the frequency. Here it is, the absolute frequency for each of the texts. And we can also look at this in a, in a more interactive way. So we could, we could uh, sort these and so on and so forth, but we are not doing this here. Okay, of course, now that we have this data frame, we can use data frame functions to get the statistics. So for example, if we want the um, standard deviation for the, we can just run this command and we get the standard deviation for the within our data frame for the absolute frequencies. Now we can do the exact same thing for the relative frequencies based on our frequency table relative. Let's say here, we want to locate or find telegraph and the, we can just do this using the lock keyword here. And now we will get the relative frequencies for telegraph and the across these texts. And as you can see here, it is a bit more work and it is, and you'll have to go through this through the code yourself. I'm not going into too much detail here to save time, but once you've done it yourself, you'll understand how this builds up these tables allow us a lot more flexibility and they are also easier to read when it comes to filtering, filtering this information. Now, as we can sort data frames and work with them in any way we want to, we can also look at a diachronic perspective if we want to. So here I'm not going into the um, command here too much because that is pandas, pandas logic and I can only um, advise you to have a, have a more in-depth look at pandas but here just go with it. But what we're doing here is we are sorting, resorting the data frame based on the title of the file. And as the title of the file has the year in it, we can leverage this to plot the frequency of a word here, this telegraph over time, looking at our data. So for example here, and this doesn't tell us much in terms of 
um, in terms of research. It's just an example. But we can see we've sorted from 1807 to 1872, and we have plotted, just using this plot function, because data frames allow us to do this, we have plotted the relative frequency over time, over the documents, obviously, but not just not over time, but over the documents, but the documents are sorted over time. So this gives us a nice little insight. We can also get the total for certain uh, for rows or columns. So here we are going to plot again. And here we can see the relative frequency sorted um, and then we plot this. And here we can see similar, similarly to as above, uh, more or less a Zipfian distribution. So we can also um, use that to plot, to plot this and of course work on these tables. And again, you can think of a data frame just as, as, an, as a sort of as a sort of Excel sheet and having all of the frequencies in this table format, you can work with this. Also, you can relatively easily export a data frame into an Excel sheet, for example, and then work with the tools you want to use. Now, how would we do this? So again, looking at the documentation, this documentation for pandas, I'm looking at a data frame and then a pandas data frame has this method to Excel. So we can see if they have if they have any examples. Yes, they have. So here's an example. We have a data frame. We don't need to create this. And then we just do data frame dot to Excel and a file name. So let's try this. So we will go, what was our data frame called? DF, let's take the relative one dot to Excel. And then we just go frequencies relative dot xlsx and we will run this it will take a second apparently it has finished we can look at our files here for a second and we can see this excel file here and if we open this we can see that we now have the frequency information and the texts in an excel spreadsheet that we can work with Okay, so let us move into another core methodological framework or a core staple of corpus linguistics, and that is collocation analysis. So here we need to write a function that allows us to find collocates of a given word in a given text file. And the question states, if you want to do this from scratch, you will have to implement a collocation association measure of your choice. And of course, we're going to do both of these. Before going into this, I want to introduce briefly the understanding of collocation that I'm applying for this exercise as there are many frameworks available. So we're going to use a fairly simple understanding of this. We have a node word and then we have a window. And the question that we're trying to ask is which words or tokens appear frequently within the node window or more frequently than we would expect statistically if it was just by random chance. And to solve this, we're going to first do an NLTK approach, and we are going to use this library. And then we're also going to implement the traditional approach here uh, to collocation using MI scores from scratch. All right, let's start with the NLTK approach. So first of all, we need our dummy text again, and we're going to go back to our trusty Wikipedia case, and we're going to just run this again. And here we now have an article on linguistics, and I've just gotten the length here from the tokenized, we are going to tokenize this right, right from the start, and we can look at this. So the first, so we have a document length of 306, and the first couple of tokens are linguistics is the scientific study. And now we are going to do collocation analysis using NLTK. So here I've used the bigram ASOC measure from NLTK, and again, just as a reminder, we have to import those from NLTK. So here we have it, NLTK, Bigram Collocation Finder and Bigram ASOC measure. So we've imported this here. Let's close this again and go back down. And we are going to use this. So first off, we set our measure and then we set a finder. That's just the way it is being done in the NLTK. And then we're going to use a Bigram Collocation Finder from words, we're plugging in our words, that is to tokenize text, we're giving this a window size, and then we are going to use that finder to find the n best using our measure, and here we're going to use PMI. And let's run this. 
and we get these pairs of collocates or of associated words. This works rather neatly, but it is, as I've put in the text here, not necessarily aligned with what we are used to in corpus linguistics and how we would expect this to look like. And this is due to the fact that, this is the NLTK documentation again, this module is used to identify collocations, words that often appear consecutively within corpora. And you can read through this and it's actually a very useful tool and it is bottom line what we are looking for, but from the standard corpus linguistics perspective, we want to find all the collocates for a given node word and we're going to implement this from scratch now so that we get what we expect from it. To do this, we need to have a deeper look at how this is being done or how one can do this. So let's first go through the theory really quickly. So again, we have a node word and then we have a left and a right context. When we do this uh, sort of analysis, we usually consider three things. A node word, that is what's in the center, and then a possible candidate for collocation. So we are checking whether a specific word is a collocate of that node word and a window in which we want to check. So for example, five to the left and five to the right. And the basic principle works like this. We find all instances of the node in the corpus. And then for each instance of that, we count the appearances of the possible candidate in the window. Then we calculate an, a score. Here we're using a mutual information score for the candidate to judge whether this is actually a collocate or whether this is just random. And then we repeat this process for all possible candidates. Most likely this is every word in our vocabulary. And then ultimately we will report the top candidates based on MI score and frequency. So how's the MI score being calculated? Well, it looks something like this, not going into all the details here because you can look this up, but essentially the MI score works using, as most collocation scores do, or association scores or association measures based on observed frequencies versus expected frequencies. So we are essentially looking for how many times we see the candidate in the window, and then we calculate how likely it is that this is um, that this is due to random chance or not. And this is a calculation here on the right, um, an example calculation for the MI score that we are using. So feel free to stop the video for a second, have a look at this example, maybe go through it. I'm not going to run through the math here in detail just to keep this video, well, it's not short anyway, but to keep it a little bit shorter. And if you're interested in how this works in particular, there are many, many, many resources to look this up. So let's now implement this in Python. So first of all, we are going to implement our MI score, our function to calculate the MI score. So here we have the MI score and we are going to plug in observed frequencies as well as the frequencies for the two words, so the node and the candidate in question. And the second thing we need is a function that checks the window. And this function will take tokens, it will take a node, it will take, so this is the text uh, apparently, um, we will take the node, the candidate and the window size. And then we will count essentially how often that thing is in the window. So let's define that and let's just run this on our Wikipedia linguistics article. So the question is, how often is human in the window for the node language given a window size of two? And if we briefly check this from the original text, I've just put this into RecEXR here, we can see that we have only one instance of human and human is next to language. So that seems perfectly, perfectly reasonable. So now we have a function that can calculate our MI scores and we have a function that we can use to count instances in the window. So now that we have this, we can start looking for collocates or we can build a function that looks for collocates and that's this function here. So we'll define a function called collocates and this will take in the tokens, our text or corpus, a node word, a window size and a minimum frequency. The minimum frequency thing is not necessary, but it is helpful as you will see below. So first of all, we will get our vocabulary and we will just do this by getting the set of the tokens. Remember the set trick. And we will also create an empty dictionary for our call kits. Now, first of all, we need the length of the corpus or the number of tokens in the corpus. And this will 
be the same for all of our calculations, so we can do this outside of the loop. So that's this n. And now we will go over our whole vocabulary. And remember, every entry in the vocabulary is a possible candidate. Well, except if it is the node word we are looking for, because the node is necessarily its own collocate. It's the same word. So we are first checking if the candidate or the word is the node. And if that's not the case, we're going to continue with our calculations. So first of all, we need the frequency of the candidate in the window, or O11 in our MI score world. And we will get this by using our in-window function. And we will plug our tokens in, our node, our word or our candidate in our window size. Then we need the frequency of the candidate, that's R1. And we will get this by looking at the, code, at the tokens and we are going to count the word or the candidate. And then we need the frequency of the node. We will do the same thing, but for the node here. Now that we have these values that we need for our calculation, we will first check if the frequency of the candidate in the window is greater or equal our minimum frequency. So if this is below our minimum frequency, we're not considering this to be a collocate because we consider this to be maybe just a fluke. If that's the same or above our frequency, we will argue, okay, this is a collocate. So we will add this to our collocate dictionary. And what do we want in there? Well, we want the frequency of the candidate in the window and the MI score. So we're going to calculate the MI score using the values we've just determined, and we'll add that to our dictionary. And then ultimately, this function will return not a dictionary, but a data frame. That data frame is derived from that dictionary. So let's just create that function. And now let's run this on our Wikipedia linguistics um, text using the word language. And what we get with a window size of one is form in off and with frequency of two and three and an MI score of four, three, two, one. Of course, we could now also increase our window size to let's say five, and this would give, give us a lot more collocates, obviously. So let's adjust this maybe back to two, and then we will be able to find collocates given a window size and a minimum frequency. If I add, if I change the minimum frequency to one, of course, this will also change again. But since we are only working on one text, having a minimum frequency of one uh, maybe is not that purposeful here. For exercise 13, we're going to move into something a bit different. Here we are going to look at stemming, lemmatization, and the use of WordNet. So the task is to use the Natural Language Toolkit to stem and lemmatize a number of words. We should use the Porter Stemmer, the Lancaster Stemmer, and the WordNet Lemmatizer and compare the results. Also, the question is, what are the pros and cons of these approaches? And the words are going to be connection, become, caring, are, woman, and driving. Also, of course, feel free to add more examples. And since you already have WordNet, try to find the synonyms for fantastic using WordNet. And we will be talking about WordNet in a second. And we are going to do these two things. So for stemming and lemmatizing, we're going to use the NLTK, and we're going to compare these stemmers and lemmatizers. We're also going to test how fast they work on a given number of words. Then we're also going to use WordNet, as I said, and we're going to utilize the syn sets to find synonyms for fantastic. So very briefly, what is WordNet and what are syn sets? So WordNet is a lexical database for English in which words are grouped into sets of cognitive synonyms, so-called syn sets. And these syn sets express distinct concepts. Here's an example from WordNet 3.1. To the left, you can see the website. So here's, uh, I searched for the word dog, and we get one syn set for dog. And within that syn set, so within these um, cognitive synonyms, we find domestic bog, dog and canis familiaris. And then you get additional information for this. But the idea is that these things are not necessarily synonyms, but that these are at least linked cognitively. Now we can do the same thing in Python using the NLTK, using WordNet. For that, we need to download WordNet and then we can use WordNet to get the same syn sets using wordnet.synset and then we can get the lemmas using that. This is a very, very, very rudimentary introduction here. Syn sets and WordNet as a database is, are extremely interesting. So have a look at this if this is interesting to you. Okay. So in this exercise, we are basically experimenting with different stemmers and lemmatizers and WordNet. For us to be able to use WordNet, we first need to download it using the nltk.download function. And I'm going to do this here. And I'm going to download the classic or traditional WordNet. And I'm also going to download open multilingual WordNet because that is necessary to run it. 
Now that we have this, we can go into stemming and lemmatizing. So we're going to compare three different systems or three different approaches, the pointer stemmer, the Lancaster stemmer, and the WordNet lemmatizer. And of course, stemming and lemmatizing are two different things, but they are closely related. If you are unsure about these concepts, maybe pause the video here and briefly look up both stemming and lemmatizing. There are other stemmers and lemmatizers in the Natural Language Toolkit. An interesting one would be the Snowball stemmer, um, but we're going to focus on these three because these are the most interesting ones maybe, or the most commonly used ones. Now you initialize them essentially by assigning or by, by, by taking this class or Porter stemmer as a class and then creating a Porter stemmer object from it. So we're going to do this here. And now just to see how these work, we can now we can use our uh, objects here to stem. So for example, Porter stemmer dot stem connection will give us connect and the Lancaster stemmer will give us connect as well. And then if we lemmatize this using WordNet, we will, as expected, get connection because we get the lemma. Now for the WordNet lemmatizer, it is helpful to provide it with the part of speech tag. So for example, here we have driving without any further information, but if we provided driving and the part of speech verb, so tell it what we what we want, it will realize, okay, we're actually looking for drive and the lemma is actually drive. Okay, now that we are aware of this, we will use the words from the exercise and we will stem them. And we're going to loop over this and we are going to, for each word, use the three different approaches and then we will print the output for each of these. Oh, I forgot to I forgot to run this first cell. That's why we got an error. Now I should be able to do it. And now we get this. So we get connection, connect, connect, connection, become, 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 caring, care, car, caring, R, R, and so on and so forth. And you can already see that these systems have some issues here and there. Well, it really depends on what you wanna do, but depending on, on that question, um, you can already see that, for example, um, caring and car, that could lead to problems depending on what you what you want to do or drive, 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 driving. Anyway, these lead to different results and whether this is a problem for you or what you need in your use case depends really on what you want to do. Now, an interesting observation is that the Lancaster stemmer is the most aggressive one, but it is also, at least arguably, the fastest of the three. So let's try this and let's see how fast they are. So we can use the uh, time it command. It's a magic little command that you can use in notebooks to test how fast these stemmers work. So let's run these three tools on the same word, become here, and have a quick look at the output. And you can see that it did seven runs each. And you can see that the Porter stemmer took 22, well, 23 uh, microseconds, whereas the Lancaster stemmer took 11 microseconds and WordNet took only three microseconds but the Lancaster stemmer is a lot faster than the Porter stemmer. Of course, as we can see, although it does something else, the WordNet lemmatizer is also extremely fast, but to be able to use it, we also need to have the database available and loaded, whereas these stemmers don't, don't need data available to them. They just run algorithmically without any models or data available to them. So now we are going to the second part of the exercise and we're going to use WordNet's synsets to find possible synonyms for fantastic. So here we have a search term and then we're going to create an empty list for our synonyms. And then just in the slides, we are going to look at all of the possible synsets for the search term. And for each, we are going to extract the lemmas or the lemma names for them. And then we are also going to use the set trick as before to only get the unique synonyms because it might be the case that words are in different synsets. And if we run this, we will get the following list. Fantastic, fantastical, grand, howling, marvelous, rattling, terrific, wonderful, and so on and so forth. And this actually works quite well. It's a silly example, but have a look at WordNet and have a look at synsets. It's really a very interesting database. As promised, we will now look into Spacey and its capabilities more closely. So in this exercise, we're going to use Spacey to automatically tag or annotate a text file for part of speech named entities and universal dependencies. And we're going to use a small language model, you've seen this already, to tag a given text. 
then after creating the spacey document using this model, we can then loop over the tokens and the entities to access their tags. We are also going to use this spacey, that spacey is visualize our library, to generate graphs for universal dependencies, and that is syntactic dependencies or relations. So again, we start by getting a text and we are going to use, again, the Wikipedia. And now we are going to create our spacey language, or we're going to load our spacey model and we're going to use the smallest model available. There are other models available. The larger models are better in any dimension, I would argue, but they are also more heavy on your machine. They take longer to load and so on and so forth. For this exercise, the small model is perfectly fine. And we're going to use the zero text as our document. And you've seen this before. So now running this, we have a spacey document. And now we're going to look at the different things or some of the things we can do. So let's start with sentence segmentation. So spacey provides us, for example, with an easy way of segmenting sentences. And these sentences are then provided by a generator called doc.sense. So doc.sense gives us all the sentences. Before we go into this, let me briefly remind you of the token structure before we go into sentences. So we now have our document, and our document has tokens. So let's look at the first token in here. The first token here is cologne. Now we just get the text, but we can also now get to the other attributes of that token. So let's do this a little bit more explicitly. Let's say token token uh, zero equals doc zero. And now we can do token zero. And for example, if we want the part of speech, we can do this. And if we run this, we will get a part of speech tag for that. And given that this is a very small model, this necessarily does this, this not necessarily correct, but this is the way you would do this. So here it argues it's a proper noun, which is correct in this case for cologne. Okay, let's go back to sentence segmentation. So we have tokens, but we also can get sentences. So here it's very simple for sentence or for sent in, and we're going to take a, make a list out of this, doc sense, and we're going to take the first five. Let's print this, let's run this. And now we get Cologne is the largest city of Germany's most populous federal state. That's a sentence, that's a sentence. We get these first five sentences. Fairly useful feature, so we don't just have tokens, but we also have sentences. All right, let's get into the actual meat of this task, and that is tagging and annotation. So spacey documents, as you've seen, consist of tokens, and each of these tokens, given the default processing pipeline, you don't have to really think about this, but generally speaking, when you create a document, there is a processing pipeline going on, and in that pipeline, you decide what you want. What do you want to annotate? What do you want to do? This becomes very interesting and very important if you work on very large texts, because then additional steps, for example, if you don't need dependencies, you shouldn't have that in your pipeline just to save time and computing power. But for this demo case, we just use the default pipeline. We will get associate information for each token. And we can access this, as I've shown you above, but now let's be a bit more explicit here. So for a token in the document, we take the first 10 here, we will print the text, the lemma, the tag, and the dependency. So here we have Cologne. Cologne, it's an NNP, noun. And then we get also the dependency. Is, the lemma is B, we have a verb, and the dependency is the root for, the, for that. And so you can get these these types of information, these types of linguistic information for each token in the document. Now, we can also look at named entities. So this would be something like whether something is a place, a time, a name, things like that. And this is in the doc.ents. Remember, we have doc.sense, we have doc.ents for the entities, and we can loop over that and we can get entities and their label. So for example, Cologne, GPE, Germany, GPE, so that would be a location. We have... Um, 1.09 million, that's a cardinal. We have Ryan being tagged here as a person. Well, that's not really correct. Down here, we have Ryan as a GPE. So there seems to be some issues going on here. Now, we could try to use a more sophisticated model and see what happens. So let's try. Let's go up here, and I've already added a little note here. So we can use a more sophisticated model like this. So here we're going to use a transformer-based model. We have to install some stuff. We have to download the model. It's a lot 
more complicated and it's a lot larger, but it will probably give us better results. So I've already um, done this. And now we can run this again. So let's go into our named entities here and run this again. And now we can see that we get Ryan location. So we now get the correct tag here. So this larger model apparently was able to pick up on that issue. That is very cool and extremely useful. So now let's go into dependency graphs. And for these, it is important to realize that docsense is a generator, as I said above. And we can use the next function to provide us with a new element or the next available element. So we're going to just take one sentence. We get the next sentence here from docsense. We could very well just also do something like this. We could just go doc.sense zero if we wanted to. That would just give us a zeroth element. Um, this is just another way of doing this and of utilizing the generator. And now we will use displacy to render the dependencies here. So let's do this. And now we get this dependency graph for this sentence. For the sentence, Cologne is the largest city of Germany's most populous federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia and the fourth, fourth most populous city in Germany. So maybe let's look at one simple example here. So let's look at city here, which is a noun. And city has a determiner, which is the, the fourth most populous city, the city. And this is shown in this dependency graph here. And that's how you can use spacey and displacey to not just show the dependencies, but also visualize them really neatly. Very powerful tool. Also, spacey's documentation is great, so feel free to explore that. For exercise 15, we are moving into another field again. Now we are going to look at XML and parsing XML. So the task is to write a function that allows you to extract all elements with a given attribute from an XML file. And by the way, we're doing this because many corpora come as XML files. So for example, the function should be able to produce the following output for the file and so on and so on. And the attribute pause equals verb have bought. So we get some desired outcome here. And we're going to do two approaches here. First of all, a regex-based approach. So we are using a regular expression to find XML elements that contain the desired attribute and value. And then we're going to also use a parsing approach using an XML library to parse the whole XML tree, the whole XML structure. And then we use XPath to navigate the document and find what we need to find. So before we go into the code, let's have a brief look at XML and what this looks like and how we are going to approach this. Again, there isn't really time for a full introduction to XML. So if you are very uncomfortable with this or if this is the first time you see this, take a short break, look up how it works. Very generally speaking, an XML document here to the left is defined by tags and attributes. And we can also display an XML document as a tree. And this tree is what we are going to navigate. So in this example, we have a root that is the document. Then we have two pages. Each of these pages has sentences. And then each of these sentences has a number of words. And these words have their part of speech as an attribute. The pages have their page number as an attribute. Now, XPath is a query language that can be used to select nodes in an XML document. So for example, the query page at page number two, S2W1 would get us to page number two, sentence number two, and then the first word, which is the pronoun they. So we can use XPath to navigate these XML trees very neatly and to select attributes. And we are going to use this in our secondary approach. Okay, so first of all, we need to read that file. And here we are not going to use text directory because we just want to read this file. And we're going to use the good old Python with open statement. And I'm also going to print this little file so that we can see what we're dealing with. And this is just a small example in the BNC, British National Corpus style. So this is what we're looking at. We have a sentence and we have words. And then there's also a C tag here for the punctuation. All right, and that's what we are going to work on. So now let's first go into the regex-based approach. So parsing XML or HTML or anything 
for that matter, that's similar to that manually usually is not a good idea. We always want to rely on existing libraries because parsing is actually quite hard. And for most standard things, XML, HTML, and, and so on, there are very good parsers available that help us to do this without running into any big problems. Nevertheless, we can still do it. So to do this, we will define a find elements regular expression function. And this will take in the XML, it will take in an attribute, and it will take in an attribute value. And we are building a regular expression here, this one, that will look for tags or elements that have this attribute and the attribute value. Pause the video, have a look at the regular expression if you want to, but it works very similarly to the other regular expression examples that we've did. And then we will find all the XML elements that fit these criteria using regular expression dot find all and then our regular expression. And then we will return the elements. We're going to select a group here because we only want the text in them. We will return this and this will allow us to find the elements. So let's run this and then let's try this with pause verb and we can see that we have half and bought from the text. And these are the words in our document that have the pause attribute with the verb value. So this works quite well. But as I said before, we don't want to do it this way if we have any other option available and we do. So let's look at the parsing approach using LXML here. So we write a very similar function, but we're going to use this library and we're going to parse this. So this time we have find elements LXML, again, XML attribute, attribute values, and we're first going to use this to get the tree and the root. And now the find all function for LXML has XPath support. So we can now use the XPath query language to actually find this. And this is very similar to what we've seen in the slides. So if I run this, we will print have and bought. By the way, I have print here. Um, we could also define this as a return statement, but it is not necessary here because we just want to print this. And it finds the same things here, but it will be a lot more robust than our regular expression approach because it will also, given that LXML is very good at parsing XML, it will also work on cases where the tag maybe looks a little bit different and where our regular expression would not catch it. Okay, we've already dabbled with XPath here a little bit, but let's utilize LXML to its fullest. And here we can directly input our file path. So we're going to use this XPath example here. And we're going to get our tree right away. And now we can use XPath queries such as this one, page one, sentence, we're looking for sentences where the part of speech is verb. And then we are doing a little bit of list comprehension here to find them. So was and smelled for the verbs on page one, or we can get the first word in the second sentence on page two if we wanted to do this. So again, we do a tree dot find all, and then we do any page, well, page number two we want, and we want sentence number two, and we want the first word. And if we do this, we will get back they. And this way we can use XPath to navigate these documents and to find whatever we are looking for. For exercise 16, we are going to have a look at web scraping. And web scraping means that we're getting content from the internet. And we use this, for example, to build up a corpus. So the task is to write a function that scrapes the text from a given website. The function should take a URL as its input and return the text present on the given website. For example, Wikipedia. If you want to challenge yourself even further, try to remove boilerplate, which is everything that is not the main text from the result. We're going to do two solutions here. The first will use requests, a library that allows us to do web requests to get the HTML for an article, an, an Wikipedia article. We are then using Beautiful Soup, a parsing tool, a navigation tool for HTML, similarly to LXML, but very, very, very cool to parse the HTML that we get and then return the content of the body content diff of the Wikipedia article. And this will make sense in a second. And then we're also going to do the same thing, but we're going to use just text a neat little library that removes or tries to remove boilerplate automatically. And we will have a look at that. Before we go into the actual coding, 
we should have a quick look at how web requests work. So generally speaking, we're looking at GET requests here. There are other types of requests. We're looking at GET requests. Generally speaking, in order to retrieve a website, your browser, that's called a client, sends a so-called GET request to the web server. And then the server here in pink responds with the website or the content of that website by sending HTML, maybe other content, but the core thing is HTML, to your client. The server will also send a status code that is indicating whether the request worked. So basically you say, hey, I wanna get this page. Then the server says, okay, here is your content, code 200, that means okay. A 403 would, for example, be a forbidden or a 404 would be, I cannot find that content and will get this back to you. Now the requests library is used to do exactly that. And with requests, you can essentially use Python as a sort of browser. And this looks like that. So you send a request, get request to, for example, the Wikipedia, then you'll get a status code and you'll get the content or the text, which is the HTML of that website. And that is exactly what we're going to implement now. So here we are first using the requests library. We have a URL here and we're going to get the Wikipedia article for the COVID-19 pandemic. Bummer, I know, but it's a topical, topical Wikipedia page. And then we're going to use the requests get URL function to actually retrieve that, to send that response. So we are the client and we are asking the Wikipedia servers to get us this page. And then we're also going to look at the response code and the first 25 characters of the content. So let's see if this works. We get a status code 200, so that's great. And we get a little bit of HTML here indicating that we are good to go. Okay, for our first approach, we're going to use beautiful soup which can parse HTML. So we'll have a look at this. And here I have rewritten that function, essentially what we did um, a second ago, but as a more general purpose function. And we call this scrape Wikipedia. So we give this a URL and then this will get the content from that URL, similarly to how we did this above here. And it will also create a so-called soup using beautiful soup. And the soup here, uh, you can think of this as the tree uh, in the XML uh, exercise above. And then we will do something strange. We will use soup.find diff ID body content. And this is something we need to figure out beforehand. So let's have a look at that. Okay, so here we have the Wikipedia page in question. And I've also opened the developer tools and you can do this by pressing F12 on your keyboard. Now the question is, what are we actually interested in? And we are actually interested in this main content here, the content of the article. We're not so much interested in the navigation or these points up top here, this navigation. We just want the main content. We need to figure out what this is in the structure of this page. So I'm going to click this button up here and I'm going to mark this piece of content in here. And now here to the right, I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. We can see that what we are interested in actually is this diff with the ID body content, right? This is the container, a diff is, you can think of a diff as a content container. And this diff that has the ID body content actually holds all of the content that we are interested in. And that is why we are parsing the HTML, this is all the HTML, for, or why we're looking for this specific piece of HTML for content, because we only want to extract whatever is in this content container. Okay, so we are looking for that, and then we're going to return the text of that content. At least that's what the function is doing. So let's run these two things on that article, and let's see what we get back. Here we get a whole lot of HTML, and of course, within that, we also have the HTML itself, and the CSS, and the JavaScript, and everything that's present on here. But this should be the main box. Now that we have this, we can, of course, parse this further down, or we have to parse this further down, because this obviously doesn't help us too much. So let's say we want to get all of the H2 headlines. So we are going to do the same thing, but manually this time. We could also use our scrape Wikipedia function and plug this in, but let's build this, uh, build this again from the top. So just to understand how this parsing goes, so here we have soup, find all H2, so all H2 elements. And then we run this, and now we will get 
the headlines. So that would be etymology, epidemiology, disease, and so on and so forth. Now, if we were interested in the actual text, and we could also implement this up top here, we could also look instead of h2 for the p elements, which are paragraphs, and this will get us back text, and this will be a lot closer to what we actually want. Having this knowledge, we can also just do this and modify our scraped Wikipedia function, and instead of just returning the text, we can do find all and then p here, and this should get us a lot closer to our end goal here, or to our goal here. Now, if we run this, we get still HTML, but we get all of the paragraphs from that body content diff. So this should be just what we need. And then we would need to continue doing this until we just have the text. But for this, we will look at just text now. So as I said, just text is a library and a tool that has an algorithm for boilerplate cleaning. So we are now going to write a very similar function, but we're going to utilize just text to just do this. So again, we are going to get the HTML, and then we're going to extract paragraphs using the just text function. And we also provide a stop list for the English language. And now we need to do a little bit more. So we initialize an empty list for the text. And then for each paragraph, because we want to build up the whole text, we are going to check whether the paragraph is boilerplate. And if it is not boilerplate, according to just text, we are going to append it. And then we're going to use join to join our text together and then return it. So let's see if that works. Let's run this. And as you can see, we get a fairly clean version of just the text for the article. And if we were to do this with the approach from above, we would have to do a lot more of additional work. However, when you use tools like this, it is extremely important to also have a look at what exactly this does. So have a look at the algorithm. Also, when working with stop lists, or stop words, it is a good idea to check them. So with just text, you can just have a look at them. So what I wanted to say here, or what you need to understand is that whenever you're using third party libraries like this, especially if they are doing magic to a certain degree, always check their underlying assumptions and how they do what they do. So we've reached a final exercise in this video. And here we're putting everything together and we're building a system that is able to perform keyword analysis. The ultimate goal of this exercise is to write a system which can perform basic comparative keyword analysis on two corpora. This is going to be a target corpus and a reference corpus. So we have four tasks. We're going to use a web scraper to build a small Wikipedia corpus. That's going to be our target. We're then going to use the COCA as our reference corpus to compare the Wikipedia corpus against. We will then generate frequency lists for these two corpora. We will then implement a keyness statistic. Here we're going to use simple maths to determine the keywords. All right, let's go into the notebook and do this step by step. But be aware, this is going to be quite a complicated task, and we are going to have a couple of different steps that we need to go through. All right, so let's start by compiling our tiny Wikipedia corpus, which is going to be our target corpus. So first, we are going to create a list of URLs that we want to scrape. And here I've picked three Wikipedia articles, all dealing with linguistics. It's a linguistics, social linguistics, and language change article. Now, we want all of these articles, and we're going to download or scrape them using our scrape Wikipedia just text function from above, we want them to be in one string or in one document. Well, we could have them in multiple documents, like in a regular corpus, it is a lot easier if we just deal with two strings that we're going to compare. So here, we're going to create an empty string first, and then we're going to loop over these article URLs, we're going to scrape them, download the text, and then add just a new line or line break character after each article. So let's uh, run this again. This should work. And let's look at the Wikipedia corpus text. And as you can see, that seems to have worked, but we still have these typical Wikipedia references referencing uh, sources in this text. So we're going to remove them using regular expressions. We could have done this in the exercise above, but we didn't for clarity's sake. So let's do this here. And we're just going to use a regular expression substitution here using this expression here that will find these brackets with numericals in them. And we will replace them with nothing. So let's see if this works. It, it really does. So this is a little bit more clean than before. And data cleaning is a typical activity. This is just one example. Now, we're also going to transform the whole text 
the corpus, the target corpus into lowercase because this removes the amount of types. And then we're also going to tokenize the corpus using our tokenize function from above. And this should get us set with the target corpus. Let's have a look in the uh, Wikipedia corpus tokenized just so that we can see what we have. Let's have a look at the first, I don't know, 25 tokens here. And as we can see, this is all lowercase. We don't have these um, references in it. All seems to be perfectly fine. All right, now that we have the target corpus, let's go to the reference corpus. And for the reference corpus, we are going to use the COCA sampler. So this is the corpus of contemporary American English. And we're going to use the sampler as the reference. As we have transformed the target corpus to lowercase, we have to do the same thing to the reference. And here we are going to leverage text directory again because the COCA sampler is just a lot of files. And again, we want to have them as one string that we can work on. So we are going to use text directory. We're going to stage a lowercase transformation. And then we're going to aggregate the documents and then we're going to tokenize them as well, similarly to how we did it with the Wikipedia articles. And we can do the same thing here. So let's have a look at what we got. Reference corpus tokenized. And let's take the first 25 here as well. And we see that that seems to have worked as well. Well, there are some some uh, artifacts, I would say, in here, but we're not going to deal with them as we want to keep this reference as it is. And we could, of course, deal with this, but for now, let's just assume that we are fine with this. All right, so we now have our two corpora ready. We have the target, and we have the reference. The target is the Wikipedia corpus, the reference is the COCA. Now, for the third step, we need to get frequency lists for these. And we're going to follow the same pattern that we did in exercise 10. First of all, we're going to get the shared vocabulary of the two corpora, and that is important. In exercise 10, we only dealt with one. Here, we are dealing with two. So we are going to create a set of the reference corpus tokenized and the Wikipedia corpus tokenized. So this will get us a list of all the types in these both corpora. Again, similarly to exercise 10, we will generate frequency tables for these two. And we are going to do this in one go. So we're going to build a frequency table. That's going to be a dictionary. And we're going to use the enumerate function to basically give indices to these two corpora. So the I here is going to be the indice, and then corpus is going to be the corpus. And zero is going to be the target or Wikipedia, and one is going to be the reference or the coca. So for both corpora, we're going to start with an empty frequency list. Then we're going to use the get frequencies function from above, and we are going to run this on the corpus. Then we are going through the vocabulary, and remember, vocabulary here refers to vocabulary of both of these corpora, and we're going to append the frequencies for each word in the vocabulary for both of these corpora. And we do this because there might be a case in which a word is in the reference that isn't in the target, or vice versa, and this is going to be the case, but we need the frequencies for all of them for us to be able to compare them. That's why we need the whole vocabulary. If this is confusing to you at this point, stop the video, go back to exercise 10, and have a look at this with only one corpus. This is exactly the same thing, but we're going to do it on two corpora at the same time. Then we're going to append this to our frequency list, and ultimately, we're going to update our frequency table for the corpus. So the frequency table will hold both corpora. I is the index for the corpus, and we will add the frequency list for that given corpus. So we can have a look at this. So let's have a quick look at our frequency table. Well, first we have to actually run it, and this will take a second. And now we can have a look at this. So if we just have a look at what we get here, we can see the frequencies for corpus zero. And these are the frequencies. And keep in mind the frequencies for the whole vocabulary. So the vocabulary is both corpora. And then down below, you would see the same thing for corpus one. Now we have a comparative frequency table that has the absolute frequency for all words in a combined vocabulary. 
And we will now use the same trick we did above where we create a data frame to show these numbers. And to make our lives easier, as I put it in here, we will also rename the column so that we know what we have, Wikipedia and Coca. And if we run this, we should see a nice little table that shows us a couple of these um, words from the vocabulary and then the frequency, the absolute frequency in both the Wikipedia and the corpus. So far, so good. We are halfway there. Now, a quick discretion, or we are going to briefly look at something completely different because this is going to pop up and it is out of experience, quite confusing. So we're going to look very briefly at anonymous functions or lambda functions. Lambda functions are extremely powerful, but very hard to comprehend. On the surface level, and that's all we're going to look at. Uh, they are functions without a name, and you can also define them on one line. And they're usually used whenever we require a function only once or for a very short period of time. So they look like this you assign them just like a variable. And then you have lambda, for example, here, a, a plus 10. And now x is a lambda function. x is a function that performs the task here. So the task here is to take a and then add 10. So this would give us 15. In the following, we're only going to use them once, specifically when we're using apply in a data frame. And apply means that we apply a function on a, a series of data. Um, so, for example, if you have uh, a row and you want to apply a function on values in that row, you can use apply and then provide a function. And usually when doing this, we provide a lambda function instead of um, a regularly defined function. So we can look at this example. Here is that lambda function defined in one line. We could also change this to, let's say, a plus 20. And then x is that function and we can use that any way we want. Okay, that was just a little side note here so that you don't get too confused. Now we have our frequencies, our absolute frequencies, and we're now going to come up with a Kina statistic. And for that, we're going to use Kilogarev's simple maths parameter. There are many different Kina statistics that we could use, but the simple maths parameter is very simple to implement, relatively easy to understand, and works quite well. So the simple mass par parameter essentially looks at the relative frequency in the target and in the reference, and then you have this parameter k that you can set in order to emphasize low frequency items or high frequency items. If you are interested in how this works in particular, there is a very interesting, very short, and very cool article by Adam Kilgariff that you can have a look at. So if you're really interested, have a look at this now and then come back to the video. We're going to implement it now in Python and you'll see that it works quite well at identifying the keywords. So to implement it, and we are going to call it SMP, we need the frequency for word in corpus one, the frequency for word in corpus one, and we also need the sizes of the corpora because we need to get relative frequencies and we're going to do this in here. So we could now first get the relative frequencies for everything and then do it, but I've decided to put all of this in this SMP function. Essentially, we're getting the relative frequency for word in corpus zero using our relative frequency function and the same thing for C1. And then the SMP actually is just a formula you've seen. So it is the relative frequency plus this parameter k divided by the, rel by the other relative frequency plus this parameter k, and then we are going to return this. Let's get some intuition on how the SMP works. So here I've created a little example. We assume two corpora with a thousand tokens each, and some word will appear a thousand times in token uh, in corpus one and only a hundred times in corpus two, and that will give you an SMP value of about nine. And now we could change the K parameter here. So let's do this. This is what we just did with K100. For example, increase our K to a thousand, and that would lower the SMP value. So the K parameter works like a filter. And the lower you set the parameter, the more low frequency items you will basically identify and the higher you focus on higher um, on higher frequency items. 
you can play around with this and get a little bit of intuition, but also have a look at the paper if you want to uh, get into this. So now to calculate the SMP values, here again is our data frame keyness. Right now we only have the absolute frequencies, but we are missing our SMP value. So let's first retrieve the corpus sizes, and we can do this as we did above by just looking at the length of our tokenized corpora. Length of the corpora will indicate, well, the size of it. So we get CS0 and CS1. Again, uh, 0 is the Wikipedia corpus, 1 is the reference corpus. And now we will finally use the lambda function. And what we are going to do is we're going to create a new column SMP in our data frame. And we do this by using the apply function. So we are applying a function. And this function is going to be this lambda function. And this lambda function is going to take the row. So for each row, look at uh, the keyness uh, table here. So this is a row, right? Let's uh, imagine the coveted row here. So for each row, it is going to take the SMP function that we have, and it is going to take the zero element of the row, so that would be the Wikipedia. It will take the um, first element, that would be the COCA, and then it's going to also take the size of the Wikipedia corpus and the size of the reference corpus, and it is going to write or ap apply this function, and it's going to write the resulting SMP value into this new column. So let's run this. And now if we look at the data frame or the table again, you will see that we have SMP values for our words and for our two corpora. So that is great. Now we have the keyness statistics and we have the absolute frequencies. The keyness statistic obviously is based on the relative frequency, but we don't necessarily show them here. We don't have to. But now to find the keywords, we need to sort our data frame by the SMP. And we also need to find a cutoff value where we define if this SMP has been reached, we consider this to be a keyword. And we can do this very simple, simply in the data frame. So we take our data frame and then we are filtering by SMP greater 1.5. So we define 1.5 as our cutoff, could be any other cutoff. And then we're also sorting our values descendingly according to the SMP. So let's run this. We get three keywords here. Well, our cutoff value is relatively high and that is language of and languages. So we could argue, and this is a very neat little finding, that language is overly often used in articles about linguistics as compared to the COCA. And interestingly, off is as well. Now, if we were to set a different threshold, let's say 1.2, uh, we could also see that things like study, words, social speech appear here. So maybe 1.2 is a better cutoff value than 1.5 here. So maybe let's change this because it is a bit more um, obvious then. And now we have our list of keywords sorted by the keyness statistic. And we also have the absolute frequencies in these two corpora. Now, of course, we could also add our relative frequencies here if we wanted to. Now, as a bonus, we can also look at a stem version of this because, as you can see in this list, language and languages are treated as two different keywords here. And that might be a problem for you as they are essentially the same thing. And possibly, if we were to stem this, we would see that language or languages stemmed is even stronger because here we divide this, whereas this arguably is the same thing. So let's have a look at this. And here I've just redefined the key functions for readability, so we can ignore this. And now we are changing the get frequencies function into a get frequencies tokenized text function because we want to do the tokenization ourselves. Or put differently, we want to put in our own tokenized texts before we actually get the frequencies. So now we need a function to stem our text or our corpora. And this thing here will take in a list of tokens. And for each of these, it will stem them and put them back into the list. So we will get back 
an equally long list of tokens, but they will be stemmed. And we can essentially test this out in a second, but we can make a little example here before we look at the actual, actual result. So for example, if we take a tokenized text, let's assume it's language languages, and now we run this, we will get back langu and langu. Of course, this isn't the same thing, but for our purpose, it doesn't really matter whether this is an actual word or not. What matters is that these two are now being treated or can be treated as one. And just to demonstrate this, of course, the same thing could have been achieved using a list comprehension. So if we look at this, same thing. And now we just do the exact same thing we did above. I put all of this into uh, one cell here, but we are using the stemmed versions of these corpora instead of the regular ones. So let's see how this works. So this has finished. Just uh, for you to see below, this took about two minutes in runtime, so a lot longer than the one that we did previously. And now we have a stemmed version of this, and this is quite different from the one we saw above because now we bind these items together and language now is a lot stronger, uh, stronger in a sense from in the sense of the SMP. And we also use the cutoff 1.5 here and also uh, linguistics and so on is now also a keyword. So this is a very important strategy to use if you're interested in keywords. Now, what's also important is to realize that this keyword approach in the same way we did it here does not just work on well, items uh, or word frequencies, but you could also use this for POS tags and look, for example, for POS key tags, or you could use this on other things that you can annotate or tag. All right, this concludes these exercises. I really hope that you've learned something and I would really, really, really suggest that you go through these exercises on your own. You can take the solutions notebook that's available that has all of these solutions and then just work through it, experiment with it, have fun with it, and just try to play around with the notebook, try to play around with the exercises in order to really understand what's going on under the hood.